owns a gorilla suit, and I couldn't resist. <laughs> so after warming up to the group, about 30 of us went out to Rittenhouse Square and sang a carol to the first DNA, to the tune of the first Noel, and then proceeded to play with various people in the park. So <laughs> walking in a hunched position, I'm still feeling it. So. so Valentine's Day. What are we talking about when we're talking about Valentine's Day? Nine days from today, February 14th, we're going to celebrate it. What is Valentine's Day all about? Now stop right there for a second. If I was in the audience and somebody started off a talk with those words, I'd hear some warning bells. I'd worry that the speaker was about to give a definitive answer with the power of the pulpit. An answer that would only reinforce their own stereotypes, their own assumptions, their own prejudices. If the setting for this talk, for example, was in a conservative environment, I particularly would be worried that they were going to give a talk about a straight and narrow path through the garden of love. Heterosexual couples chased before marriage, dedicated after marriage, and heading towards a life of monogamy and children. Add a few candles, some wine, and voila, there's Valentine's Day. If the setting for this talk was a progressive environment, like this one here at the Ethical Humanist Society, I'd probably anticipate a self-congratulatory speech about how we have overcome our previous prejudices and now appreciate that Valentine's Day includes gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. That the roses and chocolates and candles are for them too that we should work so that the cultural narratives and civil laws that sanction relationships become more inclusive. For too long, this celebration of love has excluded anybody except the stereotypical Romeo and Juliet. Well, this is a progressive environment. We're a welcoming community. We firmly support marriage equality and civil rights for sexual minorities. We demand protection for the harassment of gays, lesbians, and transgendered people in our workplaces and our schools. And after viewing the Southern Poverty Law Center film Bullied here last Wednesday upstairs, we're reminded that this is not just about warm feelings and roses and candles. This is about the mental and physical safety of all of us, especially our children. But my talk today is not intended to be self-congratulatory or to provide pat answers, because there's so much that I don't understand, and I don't think I'm alone. I'm not sure what it is, for example, to be single on Valentine's Day. Does being without a romantic partner make February 14th just a day to get through or to ignore? Is this a party to which those who by choice or by luck live alone are not invited? Even those who do have romantic partners, it's not so easy to agree on what relationships we are celebrating that day. I mean, take, for example, romance and intimacy that pushes the envelope regarding the difference of age between those involved. Now, I'm clearest about the relationship between adults and children. Child sexual abuse is a tragedy. I want to be clear about that. But what does it to do about this subtle discomfort I have when reading about a 22-year-old woman marrying a 63-year-old doctor who happened to have been her the, one, the doctor who delivered her. Anybody know who that is? Karen Santorum. Before she married Rick Santorum, supposedly, according to the Philadelphia Inquirer, she had a relationship before they met with a man that was 63 years old and delivered her. So my own reaction to that is not totally comfortable. But if they were loving and respectful for, towards each other, what's wrong with that? So what do I do with my own biases? What do I do with my personal preference, for example, for monogamy? Does it color how I view those with multiple romantic partners? Or do I discount my own feelings as just subjective bias or simply the residue of my New England Puritan upbringing? Now, near the end of this talk, I'm going to explore what I really wanted to talk about today, which is what love is, and about the dissolving of boundaries where people come together into one. But so often happens, when you start to write about a topic, you have to write about the process of writing about it. So I'm going to begin by exploring boundaries, exclusion and inclusion. 
Doubting that I'm going to be able to answer the question, I want to again say, what is Valentine's Day all about? I began to think of this actually during December, during the debate of the war on Christmas. I'm intrigued about the turf battles about who owns certain times of the year and who owns certain holidays. Occasionally I think the whole thing is just plain silly, but then I also realize that the passion that some people carry for this debate comes from a good place. I mean, for example, people who defend traditional Christmas, I think underneath they're just trying to preserve their own cherished memories and their fun traditions. They want to celebrate community and nurture belonging. On the other side, others simply want the solstice period to offer greater economical or secular variations on this theme. It's not that they're Scrooges who don't like traditional Christmas and want who resent warmth and community and belonging. It's just they want to make sure that, regardless of background or belief, more people have that warmth and that belonging during that time of the year. Because Christmas time is a tough time for many people. I mean, the Christmas cheer that's omnipresent everywhere probably rings hollow for many Jews and Muslims and non-theists and pagans. But it's particularly tough for non-Christians who don't have a family or a community that embraces them during that time of the year. It can be an extremely lonely time, especially when you're not in the club and you feel isolated and forgotten. And it's one of the reasons why suicides are higher during the month of December. It's one reason why Hanukkah, which was traditionally a relatively minor Jewish holiday, was elevated to such a big deal in the United States. It's the same reason, in a way, why Kwanzaa was created for African Americans who wanted their own tradition during that time of the year that was not tied to the dominant culture. And that's why the Tree of Knowledge is welcomed by many. It came in our lobby this winter. And it's also why Human Light, which is a new celebration of humanist values, is gaining more of a, a following. I'm hoping to have our Human Light celebration in this building next year. Because we all want that feeling of community, belonging, and warmth. We all want to feel included, especially when there's a party going on, right? So what about the exclusion from the Valentine's Day party? I mean, it's a day to celebrate love. I mean, we all feel bad for Charlie Brown. Every year he goes to his mailbox, no Valentine's, no chocolate, no flowers. And I remember as a kid feeling tormented about going to school and worrying about whether one of the multiple prepubescent crushes would give me a valentine. <laughs> I mean, to lessen that anxiety, there are now rules in classrooms, anybody who has kids know about that. If you bring one card in to school on Valentine's Day, you have to bring one for every classmate. <laughs> really, that's a rule. Now, you know, given the fragile little egos and the the power of favoritism at that age. I think I probably would enforce that rule if I was in a classroom with fourth graders. But I also sort of say, well, is this just something that, for example, the right wing would say is one more example of the corrosion of tradition by political correctness? Is there a good reason to keeping some boundaries about what Valentine's Day is about? Well, the Encyclopedia Britannica says Valentine's Day is, quote, when lovers express their affection with greetings and gifts. Wikipedia says, quote, Valentine's Day is about celebrating love and affection between intimate companions. Well, if we follow those definitions, then children should not be celebrated. I mean, it's a stretch to say that intimate companions and lovers is what third graders should feel towards each other, or towards their teacher, right? So that would indicate that you restrict it. But the world's most ubiquitous expert on Valentine's Day, Hallmark Card Inc., <laughs> denies that. They say that Valentine's Day is not just for lovers or intimate companions, but if you go on their website, they'll say things like that. It's also for a, quote, an always there friend or somebody who just needs a Valentine high. <laughs> the U.S. Greeting Card Association says that of the 190 million Valentines that are sent in America, over half go to family members other than wife or husband. Teachers have become the largest single group receiving Valentine's Day cards. Hallmark makes over $4 billion annually, in part because marketers scream Valentine's is for everybody. 
no boundaries. Now, given my opinion of capitalism, I have mixed feelings about marketing, especially these holidays that become ridiculous buying opportunities. I kind of agree with Lisa Simpson, my favorite, most intelligent member of the Simpsons family on TV. She said, romance is dead. It was acquired by a hostile takeover by Hallmark and Disney, homogenized and sold off in pieces. But also, I'm more quote unquote comfortable in some ways with these dictionary definitions. I like the traditional Valentine's celebration of intimate companion and lovers, unrequited or not, because that's where I grew up. That's the culture I grew up in. But the fact that I'm comfortable indicates that I have to be even more careful about thinking about this. Being comfortable doesn't mean being right. Being comfortable often means being privileged. In a talk entitled Ethical Sex, great title, I wanted to steal it. <laughs> Amanda Poppy, who's the leader of the Washington Ethical Society, reminds me how easy it is to forget our privilege, even in this area. I'm a heterosexual man with three children celebrating 30 years of monogamous marriage. It takes no special courage for me to say that. I know thousands of stories that validate my experience. In most of the common assumptions and narratives of the culture, I'm the default. I'm the given. I can walk into any stationary aisle in the country and find an appropriate car for me to give to my wife. My privilege also allows me to talk about being more inclusive, allowing everybody into the party, without being accused or dismissed as having an agenda. This is not so for those who identify as queer, gay, bisexual, transgender, polyamorous. They're marginalized often as claiming to have special interests of wanting to get more political favors, more clout, or more sex, right? Marginalization does grow whenever sex enters the picture, in part because we have a cultural discomfort discussing it. I mean, sex can be sold and marketed, that's fine, but serious conversations about sex, much more difficult. Whether we're talking about sexual orientation, or sexual identity, or sexual behavior, our multicultural dialogue is either halting or hostile. Now, in the overall landscape of the varieties of Valentines, I suppose we've made some progress. If you go into the Hallmark section, you'll see that they have a mahogany area, specifically designed for African Americans. And for Spanish speakers, they have a sinceramente selection. Okay? As yet, they don't offer an LGBTQ line nationally. They do sell some marriage quality cards in California. And there are plenty of other companies that offer cards for gays and lesbians. But if you try to find a card for transgender or queer individuals, it's a lot more difficult. But it's clear to me that there should be such cards. Now what's less clear to me is when, regardless of whatever combination of identity and orientation and behavior is involved, when people start to talk about multiple partners. This is where I come up to the edge of my New England boundary. While I don't joke about gay or, or, or lesbian or transgender people, it's easy for me to imagine poking fun at a stereotype swinger who changes partners like changing shoes. I mean, I do laugh when I hear often powers say, hey baby, want a shag? <clears throat> easy to make fun. My reaction to such a lifestyle is not as condemnable as the homophobia that I worked out of my system when I was in high school. But I'm still not comfortable with it. I don't think it's as condemnable because I don't think the pain suffered by people with multiple partners from being ostracized is as deep or cutting or dark as the pain suffered by gays, lesbians, or transgendered people. Because in fact, especially if you're a man, much of our culture will praise you for sexual promiscuity. Not so much if you're a woman. But I'm trying to understand more deeply how people who practice polyamory, which is the pursuit of emotionally rich, 
loving and often sexual relationships, how that works with more than one partner. The forms of such arrangement are quite varied, and some take me out of my personal comfort zone. And my guess is some of you as well. Where is he going? Well, on one level, I can joke a little bit about my discomfort because it came from growing up in sort of a repressed New England environment. My family never talked about sex. We were timid about it. If anybody brought it up, it was quick, quickly hushed. Because one does not mention unmentionables, right? To talk about sex in my family implied that you either have a problem with it or you wanted more of it. And in my family, that was a problem, too. <laughs> My favorite scene in The Meaning of Life, Monty Python, is when the wife says, you mean you can have sex without having babies? <laughs> Husband said, well, we have two babies. <laughs> this is too bad, because sometimes when you don't talk about things, sometimes, what you don't talk about becomes more oppressive. It reinforces, the silence reinforces stereotypes and assumptions usually bad ones. Because we all know that there are many forms of, accept, of, of acceptable love and intimacy. But there's less consensus on how broad a spectrum we celebrate, right? Now, one stumbling block also to my discussing it personally is the fact that I'm a man. I find myself somewhat very familiar with what John Irving pointed out in The World According to Garb that we live in a world where sexual violence and abuse is mainly committed by men. So no matter how good a man is, how deeply he respects women, if he's honest about the world, he always carries with him a sense of responsibility for the terrible abuse of women, of the abandonment, of rapes, of the semi-slavery of prostitution. And while I'd like to see sex through more innocent eyes, it doesn't come so easily to me. You know, until we live in a world where the oppression of women is really dealt with seriously, I find it difficult to talk about it openly with a sense of un unbounded joy. <coughs> I'd like to be able to talk like the ethical culture leader of the St. Louis Society, a good friend of mine, Kate Lovelady talked. She said, quote, we need to stand up and say that sex for pleasure is a human good. Good sex increases human happiness and lowers depression. It strengthens and deepens intimate relationships and helps people live longer and healthier lives. This is really kind of an uncontroversial statement when you say good sex and you mean it in the whole way. Well, when you look at that, there is even more diversity beyond the sexual issue because there are people who want love and even say romance but don't want sex. These people consider themselves, they call themselves asexual. Some of them do identify that way. They're not interested in or attracted to sex. It's distinct from celibacy, which is a behavioral category. But it's not that rare. A 2004 study said about 1% of the population considers themselves asexual. So what do we do with that in our stereotype visions? Now, all these different categories of orientation, identity, and behavior, I know some people here are saying, oh, you know, it's just, there's so much. How do you handle it all? Or why deal? I'm not quite sure because I'm still learning every day. But one thing I've learned from being an activist for, activist for marriage equality, the reason why I became an activist for marriage equality is because I became more aware of the pain and suffering for those who, because of social and legal boundaries, are marginalized. And now that same motivation is pushing me to learn about more groups and more types of people, like those who are transgender or asexual or polyamorous. And I want to question better my own boundaries and the boundaries of others. That's my real message today. Question your own boundaries. Don't necessarily change them. Think about them. And how does it feel to be on the other side of that boundary? In processing the profound disappointment I felt last year when marriage equality failed by a very, very narrow mar mar uh, margin in Maryland, my home state, I thought a lot about the power of boundaries, of exclusion, of assumptions, and definitions of normality. 
Many who rallied to defeat marriage equality last February and are rallying again today as I speak seem basically afraid of change. I understand that. Change can be frightening. But it was still difficult to bring out my best when the more aggressively intolerant confronted me in the Annapolis State House. My, my anger nearly boiled over last year when one particularly self-righteous person came up as a defender of marriage, right? And said, if you legalize gay marriage, when will you stop? Will you let adults marry children? Will you allow polygamy? How about animals? Gay marriage will lead to bestiality and affront to God and all decent humans. I almost thought about not sharing that because I'm so repulsed by that. Because when you're confronted with this combination of fallacious, slippery slope arguments and bigotry, it's almost easy to become self-righteous yourself, right? Because I'm right, they're wrong, right? Right? <laughs> but I'm reminded again by Amanda Poppy that we all draw our boundaries. <laughs> Wherever we come, most of us draw our boundaries about ethical and unethical sex, either arbitrarily or painfully. Amanda said, quote, we have a complicated relationship with sex in America, where we are awash in highly sexualized images from the media, while placing rather strict boundaries around the kind of sex we find acceptable. There are decisions to be made, guidelines to follow, that help us be sexually and emotionally and ethically healthy beings. Well, Felix Adler, the founder of Ethical Culture, he had guidelines. He founded, in his graduate school, a chastity club where he prayed, promised to pursue his PhD and not sex. <laughs> now, it may seem a little bit old-fashioned, but he was doing it in some big degree because he condemned the ridiculous hypocritical gender rules that said that men could sleep around without ruining their reputation or job prospects or marriage prospects, and women could not. He spoke about that. Later, he promoted Victorian-style marriage, which meant monogamy and ruling out divorce. He said, binding ties are welcome insofar as they are necessary to unbind what is highest in us. He thought that to flit around from partner to partner would make it very difficult to have truly deep ethical relationships. He counsels that time and patience and discipline are fundamental to ethical, intimate partnerships. He wrote in Life and Destiny, we are not married on our marriage day. On that day, we begin to be married. The true marriage is an endless process, the perpetual interlinking of two souls while life lasts. Now, I really appreciate Adler's emphasis of the ongoing work that's necessary to have a relationship continue to grow. But it seems unwise to struggle in a destructive marriage that brings out our worst. And for too long, wives have been controlled and denied the power to leave abusive husbands. So for all people, particularly women, I think divorce is an absolute necessity as an option. I can only imagine what Adler would say about same-sex relations or marriage, or transgender people, or polyamory. But I'm still learning myself about these variations. A hundred years later, about identity, and orientation, and behavior, and I'm still learning about sex, and I'm still learning about love. So, love. This is dedicated for, to everybody. To learning more about having a better appreciation of these varieties of Valentines. As a philosopher, I could turn to the renowned rationalist René Descartes, who, despite coming from the land of romance, France, was probably a boring date, my guess. <laughs> he wrote, love is an emotion of the soul caused by a movement of the spirits which impels the soul to join itself willingly to objects that appear to be agreeable to it. <laughs> Hardly poetry, but what can you expect from a man who 
build his reputation on, I think, therefore I am. <laughs> Rene, <laughs> how about I feel, therefore I am? He actually meant the same, but that's for another time. Descartes' not a romantic. He doesn't write romantic novels like D.H. Lawrence, who said, the moment the mind interferes with love, or the will fixes on it, or the personality assumes it as an attribute, or the ego takes possession of it, it's not love anymore, it's just a mess. <laughs> In the romantic tradition, love does not fit into neat conceptual boxes. It overflows what tries to contain it. Like water, it seeps around walls and submerges structures. Its beauty is unbounded. It's the mixing of waters, many flowing into one. Shelley writes in his poem, Love's Philosophy, the fountains mingle with the river and the rivers with the ocean. The winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion. Nothing in the world is single, all things by law divine. In one spirit meet and mingle, why not I with thine? See the mountains kiss the heaven and the waves clasp one another. No sister flower would be forgiven if it disdains its brother. And the sunlight clasps the earth and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What is all this sweet work worth if thou kiss not me? That swept away love. Love is a force of nature, like a summer storm. It surprises us, like Cupid's arrow when it strikes. It makes us drunk and giddy, and in an innocent way if we're young, like captured by puppy love. But here comes the voice of Adler. Such a love, if unchecked by deep respect for the other person, can become an assertive love. It can be manipulating, or demanding, or fevered. The object of love can feel used, and their uniqueness obscured. I mean, I remember as a young person feeling so in love, I just wanted to be in love with anybody. And that can be manipulative. We certainly use people in this culture. And there's a science behind it, right? Pheromones, powerful Darwinistic chemical attractors in us and creating a drive to have babies and protect their chromosomes. Powerful natural selection. And this powerful selection can become so consuming that left unchecked, it can actually make the union extinguish one in the union. It's a characteristic, actually, of the root of what we call erotic love. Yeah. Erotic, there are a couple people. What, what erotic love? <laughs> because in erotic love, symbolically or actually, one of the objects of the relationship are consumed. So I want to talk about one of the most common objects of erotic love, food. <laughs> Written a lot about it. Food is erotic, has a long history from the Greek Epicureans to the Enlightenment. One well-known gastronome, if you were around France in the 1700s, Jean Brillant Savarin says, whoever says truffle utters a great word which arouses erotic and gastronomic memories among the skirted sex and the bearded sex. <laughs> Valentine's Day chocolates, aphrodisial powers, especially dark chocolate, right? Melts. In erotic love, one of the parties is devoured or consumed. Boundaries are dissolved. And this characteristic can be a part of interpersonal love. Theologian Anders Nygren writes, the very fact that Eros is an acquisitive love is sufficient to show its egocentric character. For all desire, all appetite, all longing is more or less egocentric. The aim of love is to gain possession of an object. Now, to counterbalance this possessing love, the Romantics, capital R, promoted a more noble, quote unquote, love, restrained by chivalry. This love, as you will, is about cherishing, holding sacred, or respecting the other. It's perhaps this type of love, actually, that Adler was most familiar and comfortable with. The others viewed as transcendent, placed up on a pedestal, not to be consumed by the flames of Eros kind of like Sleeping Beauty in her glass case, right? Perfect and pure, to be left alone. Nice for fairy tales, but I don't want my loved ones being out of reach. 
So I looked for a different metaphor that might be better to explain this dependence between an aggressive, erotic, consuming love and a respectful love of distance. And the one I like, like involves body and mind, flow and thought, blurring and coordination. It's a dance. It's a dance. Learn through daily life. Anne Morrow Lindbergh explains it in a wonderful book, Gift from the Sea. She says, a good relationship has a pattern, like a dance, and it's built upon some of the same rules. The partners do not need to hold on tightly because they move more confidently in the same pattern. Intricate but gay and swift and free, like a country dance of Mozart's. To touch heavily would be to arrest the pattern and freeze the movement, to check the endless changing beauty of its unfolding. There's no place here for possessive clutching, the clinging arm, the heavy hand, or only the barest touch in passing, now arm in arm, now face to face, now back to back. It does not matter which, because they know they are partners moving to the same rhythm, creating a pattern together, and being invisibly nourished by it. This is a lovely image. One that allows both for the integrity of individuals and for the dissolving of boundaries. It's about balance. And isn't that what's most important about love, romance, sex? So for me, I've found my balance in a traditional monogamous relationship, right? It doesn't mean that all people will find it that way for all or part of their lives. For some, this dance might involve more than one partner, or they may dance alone. There are such dances, and they're all beautiful. Now, I may be more traditional in my philosophy and habits. Constitutionally, I may not be one to say anything goes. I mean, I certainly don't support abusive relationship patterns. But I want to try to understand and appreciate more fully how romantic relationships need not fit my own idealized image. It seems hard enough for some of us to have the time and energy to get one intimate relationship working in our lives, let alone two or three or four or more. But that doesn't mean other people can't manage it. It takes a lot of care and attention. At a polyamory convention in Maryland, the Washington Post advisor, uh, writer Monica Hess overheard a favorite saying among polyamorists, quote, Swingers have sex, polys have conversations. Conversations are good. She observed this report a, a tremendous thoughtfulness and mindfulness that supports these ar arrangements. And I think you'd have to just to keep the chaos at bay. But that might be more me than them. Which brings me to one last overlooked aspect of diversity. The differences between people regarding the level of self-disclosure about identity, behavior, or orientation. I believe that everyone should have the right to celebrate their identity and orientation joyfully and publicly. I dream for the day that being in the closet is totally a thing of the past. It's still not, by a long shot. But I also want to respect those who declare that their intimate relationships are, frankly, none of our damn business. You don't have to share your identity, your orientation, or your behavior. It's one thing to remove the roadblocks to transparency, and it's another thing to demand that we all reveal our intimate, romantic, and sexual thoughts and behaviors. Now, of course, that appeals to me. Privacy is important to me, particularly given my New England upbringing. And it's a veiled warning to those of you who are looking forward to a sort of encounter group experience at our talkback session. <laughs> this is about as frank as I'm going to be. And my Valentine's Day will be, in part, private. But my Valentine's Day will also include a reminder of how many people still feel excluded. Whether those who feel marginalized care to share it publicly, their identity, orientation, or behavior, or not, I think the world would be a better place if they were free to do so. So finally, my Valentine's Day will it include the conviction that whatever philosophical agreements we may have about romance and sexuality, what's most important is how we treat each other. 
That's the basis of ethical culture. We may never figure out exactly what Valentine's Day is all about because it is a social construction after all. It's for us to decide this and it's evolving. But ethical humanism does emphasize deed before creed and that takes a commitment to be present with each other. It takes a commitment to each other whether that's within the framework of a traditional friendship, traditional marriage, polyamory, or a one night stand. Feminist theologian Carta Hayward that I read at the beginning puts it this way. She says, love involves commitment. Love is not fundamentally a sweet feeling, not at heart a matter of sentiment, attachment, or being drawn towards. Love is active, effective, a matter of making reciprocal and mutual beneficial relations with one's friends and enemies. Love creates righteousness or justice here on earth. To make love is to make justice. As advocates and activists for justice know, loving involves struggle, resistance, risk. People working today on behalf of women, black, lesbians, and gay men, the aging, the poor in the country, and elsewhere, know that making justice is not a warm, fuzzy experience. She continues, I also think that sexual lovers and good friends know that the most compelling relationships demand hard work, patience, and a willingness to endure tensions and anxiety in creating mutually empowering bonds. So happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Thank you.